Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, let me also acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and uh, welcome you all here and thank you all for, for coming along. It's a very, very special um, event for us. And I think, first of all, I'd like to also thank you for um, sorting out Christmas for me this year. I think that's it. Everyone's getting these books, um, these, wonderful, these wonderful children's books. And um, I just think they're so, they're so fabulous. And, and you can, of course, uh, get a few copies of those after, after this event. And I encourage you all to do that. You'd better be quick, though, because I'll be buying most of them. Um, and it's just great for me, I think, it being you know, um, an Aboriginal person and, and, uh, and a mother as well, and an auntie and, and so on, that there are these books now for children. Because so many people say, say to me that you know, there's, when they were growing up, there wasn't much in the school curriculum. And um, indeed, Shane mentions it in the foreword to, to Solid Rock, um, his book, that, you know, that growing up there was this sort of this vacuum of information. And I think that something, these books are so critical in, in educating and informing you know, the future generations of young Australians. And I thought we might, let's, should we start off with a song? I've got no particular plan. Let's start off with a song. Who wants to, you gonna give us a song? Yeah, we're going for it. We're going for it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> saying um, just arrived directly back from the 25th anniversary of the handback um, of Uluru to the traditional owners and it was a it was a great day of celebration yesterday out there at Uluru. Yeah. 
Amazing! Um, it's so it's such a thrill to sit here and listen listen to you sing that. I, growing up, of course, in in Canberra, it was um, it was like a lifeline, a song like yeah. like that song, and and My Island Home and, and others, of course, to to sort of a black kid growing up in Canberra to have the things that were so very near and dear to me, particularly you know a song about the desert in mm. some ways, um, you know, in the, in the kind of that climate because it really sort of brought the issues of social justice um, to, you know, the mainstream. There was, you know, all of a sudden, the kids I hung out with were singing these songs about, you know, solid rock, sacred ground. But I'm interested, what, what actually sort of took you to Uluru in 81, from Framlingham to Uluru? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I, I invest, I've been investigating that a lot probably in the last four or five years. What was it that, that drew me into, um, into Aboriginal Australia? That cultural reality. Um, I grew up around Framlingham Mission and uh, the old mission down in southwest Victoria, um, Archie Roach country, Gunditjmara country, Kirei Warong country. And uh, Lake Conda then was another mission out to the west, uh, not far. So there was uh, Aboriginal people were a real presence, I suppose, growing up. And what the history books were telling us. Um, wasn't ringing true in reality, I suppose. Um, somewhere around 1820, I read, um, I came across Bill Harney's book, To Air's Rock and Beyond, um, in a second hand bookshop. And that really, I guess, awakened my interest about, uh, at a, a, the deeper sense of Aboriginal culture. And I thought there's something more going on here that I'm seeing um, in daily life around Warrnambool. Uh, and, and growing up around that Warrnambool area, all you did see, I guess, was the decimation, the wreckage of colonisation. Uh, the grog, the dispossession, the racism, it was all in your face, really. Um, so I guess I wanted to see if... Uh, was culture, was their culture still out there? Was people, were people still speaking language? Was, um, the only other thing I think we got was Rolf Harris with Walkabout on, on TV. And it was very hard to access any kind of cultural reality, in, uh, Aboriginal cultural reality at that time. Solid Rock, of course, threw me headfirst, one into mainstream Australia, but at the same time it threw me headfirst into Aboriginal Australia. So at the same time you're being fated at a commercial level, you're also camping on people's floors all around the country and hearing all the stories of, you know, the massacres, the dispossessions, the racism, and you're seeing it firsthand. So it was a very bizarre, parallel world to be in. 
Um, and then it began really what's become a lifelong journey of friendships with um, you know, Lionel Fogarty and Cheryl Buchanan and the Bradys up there in Cooker Yellinger country, Jimmy Chai, the Pigram brothers over in the Kimberley, um, Bart Willoughby, a really long old friendship, um, Joey Guy, all these great warriors really who were at the forefront of the modern uh, Aboriginal musical resistance movement, I guess, mm, mm. Um, inspired by people like your dad. Mm. Who, you know. So, uh, and that inevitably led me to meeting people like Archie. Archie and I are the same age, with, he's two weeks older than me. Had he not been taken away, we've often talked about the fact that we would have grown up in the same town together. Yeah. Um, so we're making up for that now. That's a very nice lead to, um, be, because Archie can't be here, um, Shane is going to sing um, Took the Children Away, which of course is an um, incredibly moving song and for, for many of our people, of course, has a particular resonance in that, uh, you know, many of the people I know um, have had direct experience of being, you know, either members of the Stolen Generations or, you know, the descendants of, of those people and, of course, um, and again, it's a, it's a wonderful thing, I think, that our history is being told through this forum of, of music. And, you know, it's something that people can not only sing along to, but I think, you know, think about and, and you know, take on that message. So, great, thank you. Can I help me out here, Catherine? Hmm? Can I help me out here? <laughs> <laughs> Neil, Neil's two, two hours north of where we are. So it's a bit of a southwest Victorian. Yeah, we're and we're missing that. Archie here tonight. We're really, uh, we're really missing him. Yeah. And we ask you to suspend... Um, suspend... Uh, judgment? Judgment, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For this poor imitation. Fighting man, 
mother's tears could fall again. Dad shaked up and he stood in his ground. And he said, You touch my kids, you fight me. Then they took us from the family. To foster home. As we grow up, we fell alone. Cause we were acting white, feeling bad. One sweet day, all the children came back. The children came back. Yeah, the children came back. I don't think Archie would complain about that. I think he'd be pretty... <laughs> that's a wonderful, wonderful tribute to him. And I'm sure everyone here joins me in, in passing on, you know, best wishes and all strength, all strength to him. Um, that's wonderful. Mm. Um, it's interesting, though, we were talking about the fact, even with, the, uh, with his current health situation, I don't want to go into that too much, but... This is still the wreckage, yeah, of the stolen generation. All these years later, that still goes on. You know, all those years been taken away from your family. Then struggling with identity, ending up on the streets, going through that whole era of drinking on the streets and trying to find his way back home, you know, and, uh, and this is still a continuing wreckage in many ways. and. Uh, it's a huge price to pay. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the ongoing effects of that era, which is a very recent history, can't be underestimated. And uh, it always brings to mind that uh, something that uh, my father said about, you know, the past is, um, we know we cannot live in the past, but the mm. past lives in us. And certainly mm. I think for, for many of our people that that is still very much a strong, um, you know, part of the daily lives, dealing with those you know, things that happened yeah, in the past. There's a beautiful part to the story too, Hetty, um, and that is that the illustrations were, were done by uh, Archie's late wife. Um, 
it's bittersweet, it's sad and beautiful at the same time. And uh, Ruby had painted all the, uh, been working on the paintings for illustrating the book. And uh, she finished the last painting um, and then got up from the table and was playing with her grandkids and um, that was the day she died. And uh, it's this most beautiful, last loving gift, I guess, to her partner. Um, it's bittersweet, and, uh, but nevertheless it's a beautiful, loving gift to this uh, and testament to this beautiful relationship that was... 40 years strong mm. and uh, it's a great love story for this mm. country really yeah it is and it's a wonderful legacy for you know all of us as Australians and to to have it in sort of this forum now where you know children can you know of all ages as it says can you know share that story and and learn and and grow you know and gather strength from that story I think it's wonderful it's a wonderful thing for them personally as well as on a a wider level and um, that I was just going to ask I was thinking Jeff and, and Ian so with the stories also you know took the children genera- uh, the stolen generations as well as you know the Gurindji walk off being part of the book from Little Things Big Things Grow Paul Kelly and Kev Carmody's song why have why has your why has your foundation um, supported supported this work Ian um, look we we really believe that these are important stories. Um, not, not only are these our national anthems, they're I- important Australian stories for us all to take part in, uh, to recognise and make sure not only our children understand these stories and what they mean, um, but for all of us to take note. And you know, some of these stories you know, bring up emotions that we wish weren't there, um, but they're things that we have to accept. Um, you know, listening to, you know, just, you know, the song, it's, it's quite sombre to reflect of what that may have been like. And, you know, it's something that shouldn't be forgotten. We, we have a format that, you know, we can share this story. And uh, what's been best with these books in working with Indigenous kids throughout the country is they actually have a book that's about their family. Um, and to, for you know, non-Indigenous kids as well, to be able to pick up these books, have a look at them, and to understand our shared history is important. And um, I heard just before that you know, one of the books was the first choice to be read at bedtime, and you know, I was really proud to hear that, that that was the book that was chosen. And then they insisted, of course, in singing the song, um, which was a stretch for who was looking after that child. But anyway. <laughs> I'm resisting the temptation to yeah. join in here as... as <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a great project. And Jeff, you've, you're, of course, a director, trustee, are you, of the Fountain for Youth? CEO. Uh, CEO. An, honor, an honorary Just title. <laughs> <laughs> Just another... Uh, I carry the guitar cases. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> Look, I think what connects the songs and the book series is something sacred. Uh, These songwriters have felt it. They listen to the country and they listen to the people. And Archie, when his soulmate was by his side, would sing that song that we've just heard because he believed it was healing, that the truth of the song, which is very painful, sharp pain, but that if we made sure all of our children knew the truth, then it is healing because towards the end of that song, we're coming home. In Shane's song, the power is there and it's, the arms are open. It, this country is saying to us, its people are saying to us, come together. And in Neil's song, which we'll come to, it's, it's a great call of what our real humanity is all about. Mm, mm. So the, this sacredness, yes, these children are sacred and the land is sacred. And these things come together in, in these stories. The truth that shines through the lyrics, great lyric, great, great, great lyrics. When we say iconic songs, it, it doesn't do it justice. As mm. Ian said, they are deserving anthems of country. 
mm. and of heart and of spirit, spirituality. It's a little project, mm. but it is a little step down the road towards closing that space between us and, and tapping into those things, the true character of what it means to be here, the sacredness mm. of what it means to be here. Mm. Yes, certainly. I think also, kind mm. of on, yeah, on top yeah. of that, there's I think there's a timeless quality um, mm. to this that the the relevance of you know what we've we've heard you know it exists now it's as powerful as when it was first sung mm. um, and I think this is why these these stories these songs uh, are, are so valid to Australia um, what we hold dear um, collectively. Um, they're so important, and you know, in, in reflecting on all of all of these books, um, you know, there's something that we can work together on to actually walk with a bit of pride that we've recognised this, and this may be a starting point. Um, and even the pain that you feel in some of these songs, that we've accepted that pain, and it has happened. And as Jeff has, has spoken in in being able to move to a place that this is healing. Mm, mm. Yeah, it's, it's um, important, of course, in the visual arts too. I think that's, you know, it's a really important means as with, with music, and, well, the arts generally. And um, on the subject, you both sort of mentioned anthems. And of course, I've, for, for me and for many Australians, these songs are, you know, the anthems, um, the contemporary anthems. And quite a bit different from something like, I still call Australia home, or uh, what is it, the sun, a lover, whatever it is, sun, Kiss, no, sunburnt, sunburnt, sunburnt. sunburnt. That's right. Dorothy McKellar. Dorothy McKellar. There's, mm. a, you know, we've sort of grown up with those things, and Henry Lawson, Banjo Patterson, and all of those things. But you know, these, these, for me, being an Aboriginal person, these are of course much more relevant, much more connected, and, and as you say, there's that connection to country and and culture and community, and of course, um, my island home with um, its, um, you know, that I think has become a national anthem. Of course, in the Olympics, um, it, it received a incredible sort of showcase there with Christine singing it and, and so how does it feel for you Neil to to be the author of that particular anthem? Um, the best analogy I've been able to come up with is it feels like when you have a child take off in the world and do something amazing <laughs> and you get to watch it on television <laughs> with your arm chairs, it, that's my child there. Yeah, yeah I know what that feels like. It's kind of like that. <laughs> you know, um, I don't know, there's songs come in miraculous ways and they have a life of their own. Some of them get to, hurt, get to be heard and some of them take off. You can't really pick what, which ones will take off in the public consciousness, but um, I never thought, thought it would. I had no way. It was, just, it was just another song that I wrote. I mean, it was a pretty good song. I knew it was, it was working and I specifically wrote it for the lead singer of the band I was in. I was in a band called the Warrampy Band all the other members were Aboriginal blokes, and particularly the lead singer was a Gulmach man from the Elko Island originally. But he turned up in Papunya where I was working, and I, by that stage I was already jamming and having a bit of a band going with Sammy Butcher, their local guitar player. And uh, he just turned up because, I didn't know at the time, but he turned up because he was getting married to Sammy's sister. So there was no way he wasn't going to be in the band, <laughs> especially when um, he saw the guitar line on my swag when he came around to visit me because I was out in the veranda trying to blow a bit of yiraki didgeridoo. I knew a little bit. I'd been taught from a bloke up in the top end previous years. And he was different to the desert blokes, this fella. He was confident and sure of himself. And he just comes walking straight up my veranda. He's clapping his hands like this and he starts singing in language because I'm blowing this didgeridoo. And I stopped, I was freaked. Who's this fella? <laughs> he said, keep going, you got it? That's boing, boing, keep going. <laughs> I said, I don't know, I'm much on a little bit, that's all. Ah, yeah, you grab it like this, and he goes, plays it like beautifully, you know. I go, wow, you know. He said, let's, let's just like that. He said, oh, and then he sees my guitar on my swag. He says, oh, you got a guitar there? I said, yeah. He says, I'm a singer man. I said, oh, yeah. He said, what time you haven't been? Oh, this afternoon, I said, we'll be down the hall. All right. See you there. <laughs> well, you better play the song for us now. Right.
Six years I've been in the desert And every night I dream of the sea Will this place ever satisfy me? For I come from the old world of people. We always live by the sea. Now I'm out here west of Alice Spring with the wild. And a family My pilot home My pilot home My pilot home He's a waiting for me In the evening the dry wind blows From the hills And across the plain On the sea again And I'm holding it long to the speed And I feel I'm close down To where it must be My island home Is waiting for me
Fantastic. Thank you. Amazing. It's um, it's so wonderful. It's so safe for to have to you know share this stage with you and and um, and I wonder you know it, it it occurs to me it's a bit of a tricky question to ask but you know there's often that thing that people say oh for instance you know sport and politics don't mix um, that you know that there's a time and a place for everything and um, so I mean I wanted to ask you in but all of you how does it feel to you know um, and what sort of feedback or response have you had to the fact that essentially, you know, you've kind of stuck, stuck your necks out for, for Indigenous people? We stand at a time, I think, where... Um, I know in the 80s, travelling around, and I don't know if you share this feeling too, Neil, that the culture felt so strong and solid, Aboriginal culture felt so solid and so strong, meeting all those old men and old women and travelling around. A lot of those old people are gone now, and... Uh, it's much more vulnerable now than I thought it was back then. And uh, it falls to our generation to either really act or to stand and watch a culture be obliterated. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a huge responsibility. And uh, that falls on our shoulders, teaching every one of us. And we must rise to the occasion because there is so much at stake. There is uh, the oldest continuous culture, living culture, in the world, right here, and uh, we are the, as white fellas, you know, we are the beneficiaries of that accumulated knowledge, and uh, we've done a terrible job in the, you know, the first two hundred years, and uh, you know, gains have been made. We've come a long way in 30 years, but my fear personally is that by the time the mainstream of Australia realises the value and the worth of this incredible living treasure, um, that it will be too late. And, uh, you know, I, I want my children to, and my grandchildren to walk this country fully in the understanding of it being Aboriginal land. Um, I don't feel threatened by that, and they don't feel threatened by that. And uh, our generation had to build bridges to each other, but my kids don't have to. They, you know, their, their kids and all my Aboriginal friends' kids, they take it as a given. And they are the true beneficiaries of this beautiful way of belonging in this country. You know, we're all, all us white fellas are boat people here. Um, and uh, I'd like to think that I can pay homage and respect to my ancestral culture and stuff, but I really want to pay homage and respect to the culture of the people whose land I walk on. And it's absolutely deeply enriched my life. We need the young people now to really take this, to take this on. This isn't something that's been won and accomplished. This is something that is absolutely crucial and on a knife's edge right now. And uh, so, you know, I ask you to, uh, to keep fighting for the soul of this country because uh, it's just too precious to lose. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right. It isn't about us against them, it's actually about working together. So, you know, in what I do has very little to do with sport. Um, it has to do with being given an opportunity to be able to speak to people, um, to be able to communicate on a platform that I wouldn't have otherwise. Um, you know, a very different platform to what a politician may have. Um, and there's a responsibility that comes with that because of how Australia places you know, this kind of position of privilege upon athletes. And uh, I think that we should all take it on board and take it quite seriously where that responsibility can lead us. Mm. That's great, thank you. We've probably come to what um, is 
feels like it should be the beginning. <laughs> for no one, it's not the beginning, of course, but for me anyway, I'd love to keep talking and, and I just, and it just, I think one thing that struck me of to um, sharing this conversation is with you is that, you know, this word, this idea of history, and I think Jeff sort of mentioned, you know, what we're sort of telling is the story. You know, it's a, it's a different, isn't it? Storytellers, we're telling the story of Australia. And I, I just wanted to, again, thank you all. Um, and of course, those that can't be with us, the people of the past as well as the present that can't be with us for, for the contribution to, you know, to telling this story in such a way that we'll, you know, keep the story alive for generations to come. And those younger people who will be reading these books will be contributing in their own way too. And, and it's, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful story that we all share. And so I wanted to, um, on behalf of everyone here tonight, thank everyone for coming, but also on behalf of you all to, to thank you so much, Jeff, Ian, Neil and Shane for coming along. It's been a privilege. Thank you.